Hi everybody, Dr. Feist here. And uh, today I'm going to pose and try and answer with the help of Rodin here, my little question, what is an argument? Now, channeling our inner Socrates, the first thing we do, as usual, is to ask for a definition. But instead of going and leaping right into the, the technical definition of argument as, uh, as it is in a philosophical sense, which is my ultimate goal, I'm going to start by looking at the everyday sense. I'm going to contrast it. So we'll look at the everyday sense of argument versus the philosophical sense of argument. Well, think about the everyday sense of the term argument. We don't even have to try and really define that. We can just look at some examples, and there's lots. I'm just going to consider a few. Consider that we use argument quite often in the sense of a verbal confrontation, right? A disputation. We argue. Notice there's lots of, of emotion in this. People are sometimes yelling and bickering. We use different kinds of things that we think are synonyms like argument, uh, fight, uh, you know, debate, bickering, all kinds of things. Well, that's one way to think of it. Sometimes we think of uh, someone who's arguing as that they're insisting. You know, I'm arguing for my point when we're really, really saying something like, I'm just insisting on it. You know, I'm right and I'm right because, and the, the because might be followed by, you know, I, I just know I'm right. So we will sometimes call that an argument. Again, everyday sense of the term argument, no problems there. Everyday language is just fine. But that's not looking at argument in the philosophical sense of that term. Sometimes we think of, you know, people being argumentative or arguing, they're just differing. They're contradicting each, each other. Here we have a little picture of, uh, of a contradiction that the great uh, uh, artist Escher tried to encapsulate, you know, about the stairs going up and down at the same time, the notion of a contradiction. We use that as a synonym for argument in many ways. Again, not what I'm quite interested in. I started off by looking at, you know, this notion of a debate, uh, a, a powerful, emotional uh, debate. What about debates that look more like this, where you have calm rationality? And here I've got a picture of, uh, of some of the, uh, of the prisoners from the, the Eastern Correctional Facility in New York. Yeah, a prison where uh, uh, some convicts have... Uh, formed a debate team with the help of some professors from Bard College, which is nearby, and here they are engaging and ultimately beating the Harvard undergraduate debate team. Maybe that's what we mean. They're arguing, right? And arguing is this calm, reflective, rational attempt at persuading each other. There's a problem with using that too, but that again is not quite what we mean uh, in the philosophy trade by a philosophical argument. So what is it? Well. Here it is. Basically, an argument is a list of sentences. Some of the sentences we call premises, and one sentence we call the conclusion, and the premises support the conclusion. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, in order to get a better idea of arguments in the philosophical sense, you have to unpack these terms a little bit. And the first thing we'll do, though, is to show that this set of sentences uh, that, and the ones that we call the premises and the conclusion are related through this notion of support. So it's not just a set of sentences, it has, we could say, an orientation, a direction. Schematically, we could put it like this. You have premise one, a sentence, premise two, a sentence, and so on and so on, down to premise n, whatever n happens to be, 10 or 20 or 3 or 6, whatnot. Um, so you have your set of sentences, and then those sentences as a set, those are our set of, of sentences that we would call the premises, they support this notion of a conclusion, which is another sentence. I'm just going to talk a little bit in more detail, not too much, about what these terms really mean. What do we exactly we mean by a conclusion? What do we mean by a premise? And what do we really mean by a sentence? And what are we talking about when we say sentences support other sentences? Those are, those are important ideas that we should have some clarity on. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about it to give you a flavor. If you want more detail, there's lots of books on logic. Uh, as a matter of fact, you never could read them all, and they're constantly publishing new ones on logic and language and argument theory and arguments and logic induction and deduction. Here's one book, and yes, I'm a part Arthur, so it is a plug for it. But this book goes into more details of what are, are involved in arguments in the philosophical sense. Philosophical arguments, as I said, 
An argument is a list of sentences, premises, and a conclusion, and the premises support the conclusion. All right, now let's consider the notion of a sentence. There's all kinds of debate as, what a, as to what a sentence really is, right? Is a sentence just a set of sounds? Is it something more than that? Is it a set of sounds that represents some kind of abstract structure in the world? Is, do we have to go into metaphysics? Is it all just psychology? All kinds of interesting questions and all kinds of very deep puzzles when you really start to think of what is going on when we utter sentences. How do sentences relate to truth and how do we check and verify? All kinds of complexities there. Fortunately, for our purposes here, we don't have to go into all those details. Let's just look at some everyday sentences. Notice, sentences come in all types. Uh, the great philosopher Wittgenstein used to refer to the motley of language, right? In other words, it's just this great big grab bag of different uses of terms. Consider these sentences. Are you happy? Shut the door. The statue is on the table. These sentences are all meaningful, but they're quite different. For instance, it's only the third one that we, we would really say is both meaningful and true because the, sta the, the statue is actually on the table, or it could be false if I were to lift the statue up, right? then the statue is on the table, would be a false sentence. Look at one and two. Again, those are meaningful, but would you say sentence one, are you happy? Is that true or false? Be very careful. I'm asking, is the question true or false? I'm not asking about the answer, because you might give an answer, yes, I am happy. That might be true and it might be false. It's a report of your inner states. But I'm asking about the question. Can the question be true or false? That seems to be a bit of a peculiar use of language to say the question is false. You could say the question is a nasty question, it's misguided or whatever, but it's not a true or false in that sense. The answer might be true or false. So remember, when we use expressions like a true or false question, we're really saying that the answer to the question is either true or false. So be very careful about language. Same thing, shut the door. Is that true? Is that false? It's meaningful. And if you say, well, the door is shut, that's a different kind of sentence than shut the door. The door is shut is what we would call an indicative sentence. I am happy, that's an indicative sentence. Those can be true or false. But are you happy and shut the door? Those are not indicative sentences. Are you happy is a question. Shut the door is a command. Number three again, that's an indicative sentence. The statue is on the table. It asserts something about the way the world is. Now, as I said, with one and three all being meaningful and only three can be true or false, the important point, the takeaway point for us is that sentences that are in arguments are really sentences that can be true or false. That's what we're dealing with. So the second thing, in addition to sentences, okay, we got the notion of sentences. Those are our premises and those are our conclusions. We should look at the notion of support. And support is not just an all or nothing thing. It does come in degrees. But wait a second. What does that mean to say that support comes in degrees? Well, there's a variety of ways to tackle this question. I'm going to start and use a very simple way of making two large categories, which corresponds to basically the way philosophers approach this. In the first category, you have the support is total. The premises don't just simply support, they guarantee the conclusion. So it's a very, very strong sense of support, absolutely there. Category two support is where we get into the notion of degrees, partial support. Well, here, the premises don't absolutely guarantee it, but they make it likely. And you can have different kinds of these supporting sets of premises where they'll make it somewhat likely, increasingly more and more likely, but never absolutely, right? So the support in this case uh, comes in degrees. All right, so let's look at each of these categories a little more closely. I'll start with category one, the total support. Well, the name of this category really is uh, the notion of a deductive argument. Here, again, the premises guarantee the conclusion. And we can think of the notion of guarantee in a variety of ways, but one way to unpack it, let's look at uh, an, a, a valid argument. And a valid argument says something like this. If the premises are all true, 
then the conclusion must be true. And it's very important before I give you an actual valid argument to reflect a bit on this sentence. If the premises are all true, then the conclusion must be true. Think about that. It doesn't say that the premises are actually true. It says if the premises are true. It doesn't say that the con conclusion is actually true. It says if the premises are true, then, then the conclusion must be true. So the if-then structure of that sentence is very important when we think about valid deductive arguments. Okay? So we've got a valid argument. Here's an example. And it's an odd example, but I use this so that we can get an idea of how valid arguments really work and how they don't work. All cats have six legs. That's a sentence. It's meaningful. All six-legged creatures can fly. That is a sentence. It's also meaningful. All cats can fly. That's a sentence. It's meaningful. However, notice they're all false. However, you also should notice that if those premises are all true, if we were, if it were the case that all cats have six legs is true, if it were the case that all six-legged creatures can fly is true, then it would be the case that all cats can fly. So you, this is a valid argument because if the premises are all true, then the conclusion must be true. But you might say, okay, well fine, if I accept those uh, premises, then I, I guess would have to accept the conclusion. And if I were to accept the premises and deny the conclusion, then I'm basically contradicting myself. But at the end of it all, what's the point of this? Well, the point of this is to introduce the, the, the second notion of a deductive argument, and I'll use an example. Look at this one. All dogs are mammals. All mammals have hearts. All dogs have hearts. That set of sentences is an argument. That set of sentences has two sentences that are premises, all dogs are mammals, all mammals have hearts, and one sentence that's a conclusion, all dogs have hearts. Now, notice, the first premise, all dogs are mammals, that is meaningful and true. The second sentence, all mammals have hearts, is another meaningful and true. And the third one, again, is meaningful and true. And that if you accept the premises, if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. It is a valid argument. But look at the, now we have a different question. Are the premises in fact true? And the answer to that is yes. So this is a valid argument with true premises. That is what we call a sound argument. It's, again, it's a valid argument with true premises. Now, Let's look at the category two type of partial support, where it comes in degrees. This is not a deductive, but an inductive argument. Now, it's very important. With inductive arguments, things are a little bit different. There's a trade-off. With the deductive argument, it worked out very nicely, because if the premises were true, then the conclusion had to be true. Deductive arguments are also regarded as truth-preserving. If you got the truth up in the premises, then don't worry. It will be preserved in the conclusion. Truth-preserving. You can't go awry. But also, if you go back and look at deductive arguments closely, you'll find something very interesting. Yeah, they preserve the truth. Okay, if I accept the, uh, uh, the premises as being true, then I must accept that the conclusion is true. But if you look at the conclusion closely, it's not really saying anything new. In other words, it's a reformulation or it contains basically the same content as the premises. So at the, uh, at the reward of truth preserving, the, the trade-off is that you really don't say anything new. The conclusion isn't really a leap forward in knowledge. But the leap forward in knowledge is what you get with an inductive argument. With an inductive argument, the support comes in degrees. And uh, we'll look to explain this notion of the support coming in degrees. Let's look at, a, at an actual inductive argument, and then we'll contrast it with the deductive. For instance, 75% of St. Paul students, university students, drink coffee. Sally is a St. Paul university student. Sally drinks coffee. Notice, the first, second, and third sentence, they are meaningful, but... Let's look at the notion of whether or not they're true. Let's say that we do a survey 
And it turns out, we go out, we survey all the students, and we find that 75% of them, in fact, do drink coffee. And we look at the roster from the registrar and we find out, yes, Sally is a St. Paul University student, but it could, even though those two sentences are true, it could very well be the case that Sally does not drink coffee. In other words, the conclusion is false. You can have, in an inductive argument, all true premises and a false conclusion. However, what, what's the, what's the trade-off here? Well, you could be wrong, but Sally drinks coffee is something actually new. Right? It's a new statement. It says something different than 75% uh, of St. Paul University students uh, drink coffee. It says something different than Sally is a St. Paul University student. It says something about her in addition to being a St. Paul student, namely that she drinks coffee. So what you get is saying something new, advancing knowledge, comes at a risk. You could say something that is in fact wrong. But you would also say, well, it seems to be that those premises do support that conclusion. They're not entirely irrelevant. They do, if I gave you just the first two sentences, if I just gave you the premises, and I'd say, what, what do you think you could conclude from that? Most of you would probably say, yeah, Sally probably drinks coffee. But, of course, Sally could be in that 25% that doesn't drink coffee. Let's modify our example just a wee bit. Now we've, let's say it were the case that 95% of St. Paul University students drink coffee and, yep, Sally is a university student, St. Paul University student, what would, you, uh, what would you infer? What would you say? You'd say she drinks coffee. This is a stronger inductive argument than the previous one. So here's where we get the idea of degrees of support. This is basically how science works. This is how sociology works. This is how arguments in the world of various disciplines, they work by trying to get the strongest kind of inductive argument you can. So once again, with deductive arguments, deductive, everything's nice and tight and connected. The premises absolutely support the conclusion, but the conclusion doesn't really say anything different than the premises. So with that absolute support, with that no risk comes not much gain. So no risk, no gain. With the inductive ones, there's risk, but there's the possibility of gain in knowledge. And that's what sciences and, uh, and all the disciplines are trying to produce, new knowledge. So they tend and naturally to go towards the uh, inductive style of arguments. Well. Let's just uh, uh, think about this. So again, an argument is not uh, a, a debate or a fight or a struggle. Remember, an argument is an abstract structure, right? It's a group of sentences, and some of those sentences are premises, and they support a conclusion. Remember, if the support is absolute, you're talking about a deductive argument. And two kinds of deductive arguments, but they're related, one is the valid argument. If the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. But of course, it doesn't say for sure if the premises are actually true. However, if you say, oh, I've got a sound argument, that again is a deductive argument where it's a valid argument and the premises are in fact true. So that was our first category of argument. We're deductive. We looked at the second one is where you have partial support. Inductive arguments. Inductive arguments can be weak, moderately strong, very strong, depending on how strong the support of the premises is for the conclusion. So keep in mind that an argument is basically in the philosophical sense, in the scholarly sense of that term, it's an abstract kind of structure. It's a relational complex of sentences, namely that sentences uh, that we call the premises are in support in some way, absolute, partial, certain degrees of a conclusion. For a bit of fun now, and a good way to reinforce this discussion of arguments, go to YouTube and look up Monty Python Argument Clinic. And you'll watch how this, com this, this comedy group actually takes a lot of the ideas and contrasts them. The, uh, the fellow on the left in the glasses, he's going in for an argument, he's paying to have an argument, and the fellow on the right is using all kinds of incorrect ideas about arguments. And you pay attention because the fellow on the left actually states quite clearly this notion of an abstract structure of an argument, and the other one just keeps denying that and making a bit of a joke in the process. So have a look at that, and we'll see you another time. Thanks.